First of all, just making the playoffs was a huge uh, celebration uh, for us. You know, it's the first time the, in the city has had something like that, and all of a sudden now you're playing the great Boston Celtics. People don't remember, but we were the ninth place team uh, with about four or five games left in the in the season. We went on a, a 5-0 run. We won the last five games of the season, and we went from ninth place to fifth and we were playing the Celtics, and the Celtics had a really good team. You know, it was the Boston Celtics. You know, you heard so much about the Celtics and, you know, Lakers series and so many, but here it is, you have an opportunity to, you know, to make history. The idea that, that not only that they were going to be in the playoffs, but they were going to play a team with the history and, and also the recent success of a, of a team that was built around you know, Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish, I mean, to them, this was just astounding. We had to get over that some way. We had to pinch ourselves and say, I took the team up to uh, Boone and we practiced at Appalachian State before the, before the series. And uh, just to get them away and realize that, hey, look, I could have all their attention. And then, then we went uh, back and we started the, the playoff series. I remember going up to Boston Garden and was with the team president at the time, Spencer Stolpen, went through a wrong door. And there was a fan there, and he did, older guy. He said, man, he said, you guys can't even find the right door to get into the arena. How do you expect to win? First of all, I, I thought that we were younger. And an old coach once told me, you, you can't push what you can't catch. So I, I knew that we had to use our strengths to our advantage. We were very confident. Um, better team? I don't know. You know, we, we, we knew we, we could play with anybody in the league then. We knew we'd have to play well. They had, you know, future Hall of Famers on their team. We were so young, we didn't know any better. You know, a lot of teams, you know, think, oh, well, we can't, we can't do this, we can't do that. And we weren't intimidated. We went out there, uh, and um, I think our toughest games, obviously, was on that parquet floor in the old Boston Garden, in that crowd. Um, there's a lot of venom spewing out of that crowd, you know, and it made it extremely tough for us to win there. Back then it was a best of five, so I think that kind of worked in the Hornets' favor. You didn't have to win four times, you only had to win three. So it made it even more crucial for you to get at least one win in the other team's arena. I knew if we could get one of the first two games, we were going to we were going to beat beat them both times at home. We had a home court advantage. We had 23,000 people coming to pull us through any kind of circumstance. We just need to go out there and continue to play our game and, and play it aggressive as we possibly could. And uh, it was a big challenge, though. You know, playing in the Boston Garden. You know, it could be it could be cruel. They were a young team. They you know they had Grandma Ma and they had Alonzo Mourning and you know, they had a good nucleus there of of players and they were starting to play better. They had nothing to lose. They were playing against the Celtics, you know, you know one of the most storied franchises in sports and, you know, trying to stop themselves as an up-and-coming, not just team, but franchise. First ever playoff game for the Charlotte Hornets. We didn't win that first game, but something happened in that first game that was just awful. Reggie Lewis, who was the future, he just collapses on the court. Good defense that time. All of a sudden hitting the deck uh -oh. is Reggie Lewis. Is he all right? Inside to Perry. Uh oh, he's he's down right now. Yeah, he's hurt. One of my closest friends, Reggie Lewis, happened to be a former high school teammate of mine, was becoming the star of the team. And uh, and you know, it was sad to say, you know, he wasn't able to finish that series. It was a bizarre series for us because that was the last basketball Reggie Lewis ever played. If you would have told me that was going to be his last basketball game, I would absolutely tell you, no, no way. Because he was, you know, he was a strong guy, uh, great basketball player, great guy. Kind of threw us for a loop because our best player who we relied on, who, you know, uh, you know, was an all-star, you know, one of the best players in the league at that time. So that kind of, you know, messed us up a little bit. Uh, no, no excuses, but, uh, you know, losing a guy like that, unexpectedly and knowing he wasn't going to play for the rest of the series was tough. 
Celtics would win game one, but game two, we beat them in overtime in game two in Boston. Two teams in overtime combined for three points. We scored two. <laughs> Just getting the one game that we got there really gave us the confidence that we needed and understanding that, hey, you know, we, we belong here. We belong in the playoffs. You get that first win, you split the first two games and then it's anybody's series. So we lost game one, won game two. Let's see if we can win game three. And uh, Muggsy had a fantastic game against Boston. He scored 20 points and uh, he was unreal. The whole team was unreal. Alonzo and Larry were just unguardable. And uh, Hornets won. Now we're up 2-1. Well, the series was very hard fought, you know, and then when it, when it came down to uh, that deciding game in Charlotte, we made all the right plays at the right time. Game four. If the Hornets win, they move on to the Eastern Conference semifinals and the Hornets get a steal right off the break with Kendall Gill. If it wasn't for that crowd, we, we wouldn't have gotten through it. It was a very tough, hard-fought game, you know, and plays had to be made defensively and offensively, you know. And you know, we got a decent lead, maybe eight or ten points at halftime, but Boston came back in the second. Douglas with the steal! Boston in the lead! 103-102! They got the lead on us, and we're down by a one. We haven't got much time to do something, so we got to get it in the hands of the shooters. So we decided to run a play for Dell Curry. Dell was going to take the ball out of bounds. One, I took pride in, in entering that ball because any coach will tell you, you have to trust that guy's not going to panic. Uh, he's going to let the play develop. He's going to try to, to make reads. Okay, he was going to pass the ball and he was going to get three picks. And Alonzo was the last of the three picks at the top of the key, close to the top of the key. It was a play that we had run throughout the whole season. He was going to come up off of the screen and he was going to get the shot. I think the, the Celtics snuffed it out that if Dell was the one making the inbounds pass, the, the first option was probably to get the ball back to Dell in the corner. Boston obviously did their homework. You know, the way to play develop, you know, we're, we're chasing guys around and, you know, Alonzo kind of floated up top and the ball found him. And I just read the play. I went through my pro progressions kind of like a quarterback would. And I saw Robert Parrish kind of leave Zoe uh, and come around. I think it might have been Kendall Gill, um, who he kind of uh, haphazardly double teamed to try to deny the inbounds pass. One ball fake, and I'm like, there's the chief, and Zoe's not around. I looked, and there was Zoe wide open at the corner. So I just made the pass. It was the easiest pass you could make once I read the play. You thought they were drafting Alonzo Mourning to you know to be a great rim protector to be this physical presence as a post-up guy he's standing at the at, at, at the uh, foul line no one expected alonzo to wind up with the basketball but he was the only one open you know i let it go and with an extreme amount of confidence because it wasn't a shot i was foreign to and with zo once he got it and then he had no second thought but to shoot the basketball and that's I'm great I'm grateful that he did. Well we'll take that shot every time you know lots of morning shooting a top of the key jump shot you know game on the line um, you know the guy we didn't want to take the shot was Dale Curry <laughs> the other guy we didn't want to take the shot was LJ like you know the, the ball finds who it's supposed to find. He wasn't the best jump shooter in the world but on this night they threw me the ball the rest was history. If people have never been anywhere where the noise is so loud that you can't hear anything, that's what I experienced at the time of the shot. It was just a, a sound that I've never heard before. And that place went nuts. I mean, everybody was as one. It was just, it, it was, it was breathtaking. And because we had never seen that in Charlotte before, not like that. It's hard to describe unless you're there. And, uh, and I know the fans of Charlotte, 
you know, who were old enough remember what it was like. The night that we beat the Boston Celtics, I was there and still remember Alonzo Mourning laying out on the floor and the crowd literally going crazy that I will never forget. And I think those of us who've been Hornet fans forever will never forget. You know, Alonzo hitting that shot, uh, you know, that was, you know, that was a heartbreaker. He got himself open, he, you know, he wasn't afraid of the moment. I remember being, as a young guy thinking, you know, he's really uh, uh, stepped up and, you know, made a great shot. Those are opportunities and moments that, you know, build legends and character and, you know, he stepped up and made it. And watching the spontaneous joy on the player's face as they absolutely formed a dog pile around Alonzo was fantastic. The thing that I think a lot of people forget about that game is that wasn't the last play of the game. And I remember trying to get people, you know, hey, we still have time to go. We still, we gotta get back on the floor. And everybody goes back and there's kind of this dread of like the Celtics and they've got another shot. You know, they have the historical factor. Where are the young guys? My, my reaction was, man, I thought that we, we won the game, I thought it was over. You know, now this gives Boston another chance uh, to, to win. And you know, in the NBA, anything could happen. The players are just that good. Like, oh my gosh, <laughs> time back on the clock. This is not good, uh, especially at home. Hey, listen, man, normally these things don't happen at home. Normally they happen like away. How could our shot clock guy do that to us, you know? And our clock guy did the right thing. He ran the clock. <laughs> so he was, he saved his job and the referees did their job. When Alonzo made the shot, I cheered, stood up, and forgot to stop the clock. That I made the biggest mistake you can make, which is watching the game, enjoying the game, cheering, which you can't do. 104, 103, four tenths of a second left. In order to protect that lead, Kendall Gill had to block D. Brown's shot at the rim they had run the same play uh, a couple of times before where from out of bounds, uh, Kendall could jump as high as, as D. Brown. So I, we put Kendall on him and the play was for D. Brown on a lob. Kevin McHale took through the inbounds pass. And before the play happened, we know, we know what the play is going to be, okay? Because we've scouted Boston time. You know, you get, you get a whole week to scout these guys before you play them. We had drawn up that play before, as a matter of fact, I Chris Ford allowed us to uh, do some plays for practice and different stuff. And when we had drawn up that play before, you know, late, not much time, late clock, it was a pick-repick play. Again, it was a misdirection where I was going to set a screen, uh, a back screen, but fake the back screen. Um, and I rolled out and went to the rim. We knew that it would be a back pick with D. Brown coming up and back picking Larry. And then they re-pick you and D. Brown goes for the lob. I told Larry, I said, Larry, switch it, switch it. What happens when they do it? Larry doesn't switch, <laughs> right? So d Brown breaks, right? They set some back screen action that frees d Brown to go airborne. So I run as hard as I can and just jump as high as I can. And you know, d Brown, he won the dunk contest. Kevin McHale throws a perfect pass to D. Brown over the basket. But he got there at the same time, blocked the shot, boom, game over, we finally win. What a way to get yourself further in the playoffs. So when you first play off series, there's a lot of controversy about that, uh, that call, but I think they made the right call. I still think it's a goaltending, nobody still says, I put the ball in the basket and I still think it's a goaltender, nobody called it, but. <laughs> hey, look, look, I'm weak now, it wasn't goaltender. No, I mean, they, you know what, they could have called it either way, but I, I thought that it was, a, it was a, a pretty good defensive play. I tell you, D. Brown, it was, it was a great pass. It was a great pass, it was, seemed like it was on the money, and I thought we completed it, and uh, look, it looked like it was gonna, you know, Looked like goaltending potentially and stuff at it, but if the, if the ball had gone through the hoop with, from the inbound pass, it would not count it. So how can you goaltend a pass? You didn't have replay back then, thank goodness. <laughs> so 
uh, hey, the horn blew, he tipped the ball, goaltending or not, we ran, the, we ran off the floor. You look at it closely, you know, again, all the Charlotte fans saying it wasn't, and obviously the refs didn't think it was a goaltending. If you look at it closely, the ball was either over the rim and left my hand or off the, off the backboard, so. But Kendall was right there, we was able to deflect it and save the day for us. You know, the long and short of it is, is that we knew that if we played good, solid defense, you know, good things would happen. That was one of the hardest series to, 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 to lose. At the end of the day, that was my last, uh, that was my last game in the NBA. I'm all done and, uh, you know, I, I really wanted it to go out on a win. I really wanted to play one more game in the Boston Garden or more games in the Boston Garden. But it wasn't meant to be, I guess. We went through this together as a city, as a fan base, as players, as a staff. We all went through this together for the first time. I just remember feeling like it was part of a celebration with the whole town and the whole community. That That's what I remember. It wasn't just our team. It was all of Charlotte, all of the Hornet fans. And you just could feel that because of how you were embraced throughout the years, really, in Charlotte and certainly for me in my rookie year. All I remember is the energy and excitement of that crowd, man. The energy and excitement of that crowd that night, I think truly helped catapult us to our first playoff series win in franchise history. And suddenly it was official. The Hornets had won a genuine NBA playoff series against a good team. And it just you know, raised the roof. I mean, it was pandemonium. It was just amazing, amazing what happened that night, how it happened. Uh, now all of a sudden you're a star cross franchise. We gotta remember where we came from. You know, we was four years coming into the league and that fifth year we became a, a playoff team. You can win games throughout the regular season, but when you get into the playoffs and win a series, that's when the, the league and everybody else takes notice. So I think that was a turning point that, hey, okay, this Hornets team, this franchise has arrived. It's time to take the next step. It validated the hard work. It validated the unity. It validated why we all stayed here. To win that first series in your franchise history was a, a, a magical time. It meant that we were past the stage of being an expansion franchise. We were now a bona fide NBA team.